Hello, my name is John Mad Dog Call, and I'm the board chair for the Linux Professional Institute, the president of Project Calwan, and also the president of Linux International. My talk today is called The Path Forward for Latin America. Before I really get started, there are some people out there who may not know me. I've been in the computer industry since 1969. I've worked on a wide variety of different systems, basically Unix since 1980, and Linux since I met Linus Torvald in 1994. Uh, I've been coming to Latin America since 1994, Venezuela, Brazil, many of the Latin American countries, Mexico, and I've enjoyed a friendship and a fellowship with the people of Latin America. I've had a wide variety of different jobs for big companies and small companies. I've been a programmer, a systems administrator, a technical marketing manager, a systems engineer. But most importantly for this talk, I've been an educator of data processing at the university level. I also like to think of myself as being pragmatic. I'm mostly interested in getting the job done, and I happen to believe that free and open source software and open hardware are the ways to do that. I'm going to say something that may be a little controversial, but I'm sure that you'll really understand me. People today don't buy computers and they don't buy software. What they're doing is buying a solution to a problem, whether that be a game console or some other type of system. If, if they wanted to talk with somebody, they'd use two cans with a string as long as they could do that easily. They're interested in the solution itself, not in the mechanism that creates it. But in order to do that, these days you also have to worry about your supply chains. Can you get the hardware and the software that you need? Can you trust the manufacturers who are creating that hardware and software? Uh, do you know where it's coming from and who's producing it for you? These days, there are a lot of people who put Trojan horses into software and hardware, into your BIOS, into your CPU. You don't know it's there. Maybe it is the government of some country. Or it may be something not so nefarious. It could be the fact that you're trying to get some computers and you're at the end of the line when the allocation of resources. And maybe you're getting your computers from China and the Chinese government says, well, we're kind of in a crisis now. We're going through this pandemic. We're having problems with shipping. We're having problems with having people come to our factories. And so we're going to keep all the resources for our own country and we'll sell them to you if we have extra left over. So that's a problem because you are somebody who's trying to have a business. You need to have these computers. You need to have these resources when you need them, not further down the pipe. And this can also affect you when a, co a company decides to go out of business. Maybe they go bankrupt. Maybe something affects their rate the way of producing, or maybe they simply retire a product that's no longer interest, uh, interesting to them. And this leaves you, the customer, in the lurch. You have to migrate to a different one, or you have to find a different uh, producer of it. What happens if the company goes out of business? I used to work for DEC. DEC was bought by Compaq. Compaq was bought by Hewlett Packard. And Every step of the way, there was some product or service that was no longer supported by the company that was buying them. These days, we also have to be aware of embargoes. My country, the USA, had an embargo for 20 years against Vietnam. We've had one against Cuba for 60 years. And today, because of what's going on between Russia and the Ukraine, we are having... Uh, what they call, you know, embargoes or sanctions against different people or companies. It's not these people's or companies' fault of what's happening in Russia and Ukraine. 
It is the politicians. It is the leadership of the country. But still, it is the smaller people and the smaller companies that suffer because of it. And what they need to do is to make sure that they have a supply chain that in case of economic strife, they can still get the materials and things that they need. And this is where free and open source software and open hardware really shines. Because you can get free software no matter where you are in the world, and you're using the collaborative work of millions of software developers. Likewise, open hardware, you buy the open hardware so that you can easily substitute another piece of hardware for the same thing to get your product, your solution, out the door. So let's take a concrete example of this. There's a thing coming up. It's the migration of people off of, my, off of Windows 10 onto Windows 11. And we have learned that an estimated 34% of the enterprise-style systems... Now, these are desktop systems that are purchased for things like government use or educational use. They're not typically not the fastest or fanciest of systems. They don't have a lot of the bells and whistles. Maybe they're a little short on memory. And... 34% of this style of computer in use today will not be able to run Windows 11. You'll have to add more RAM to it. You'll have to add other types of devices, maybe a different uh, uh, GPU. And even then, 12% of the systems will simply have to be replaced. Now, this is from a study done by ZDNet, a magazine in the United States, and the question you have is, is this only the United States that they were looking at? Or is this problem worldwide? And if it's worldwide, is it a lot worse than just the 12%? Now, normally, people go through a, res a, a cycle of refreshing their computers. If you bought a computer last year, you might expect it's going to last for three years or four years. So by the year 2026 you would probably think about replacing it. But that's, you know, most people. On the other hand, you have some people who don't have a lot of money. Maybe school systems don't have a lot of money, and they have to make their systems last longer. So even though Microsoft says that by 2025, the refresh cycle will take care of this, today, there's still about 12 million computers in the world that are using Windows XP. And in one country, it's estimated that 60% of the computers that are used in this country are Windows XP. So you can't say that the refresh cycle will take care of this. What I'm advocating is that instead of migrating from Windows 10 to Windows 11, you migrate from Windows 10 to GNU Linux. And then your problem is much more manageable. Then you say, okay, I'm going to train my people on how to use GNU Linux. I'm going to make sure that the applications that I need will run on GNU Linux. And if they don't, I can substitute another solution, another set of software and hardware that will solve my problem, my solution. And maybe better, maybe solve it better. We don't know. But now is the time to plan for this, not when Windows 7 comes screaming out at you. So we're going to talk about various products that you can build with free software and open hardware. I'm going to discuss first the concept of a loosely coupled product, which is made up of the GNU Linux system and maybe proprietary software that works on top of that to create this loosely coupled a product. So, for example, instead of running Oracle Database on all 92 or however many desktop systems you have, you run it on only one. That is the system that runs Oracle. And everything else accesses it over the Ethernet to get the data at once. Now, you could build this out of pretty capable open source hardware put the GNU Linux system on top and Oracle on top of that. But let's say that Oracle decides that they 
are going to retire that. They're not going to support Linux anymore. Well, there's a whole series of other databases that you could use that are free and open source. It's databases like Postgres or MariahDB or Firebird or others. And these are the ones that your applications could be getting the data from over the internet. So all in this case, they're all the product is open. You're in complete control of it. You determine when you want to upgrade it. You determine when you want to buy newer and faster hardware for it. So let's take a look at six different solutions that you could build using free and open source software with not much effort at all. The first one is called Freedom Box. Now, about 12 years ago, a man named Eben Moglen, who is a lawyer and a professor at Columbia University in New York, he was also the author of GPL version 3, Eben is a big privacy and security advocate. And he was worried that everybody was going to start storing the most private and sensitive of material on server systems, run it. Microsoft or run at Google or run at, you know, other places, Amazon. And he was worried that they was going to put their most sensitive information there. So what he wanted to do was create a server that you could have in your home, relatively easy to install, no binary blobs to hold Trojan horses or worms or anything like that. And it would run all open source data, all open source programs. It'd be easy to set up and maintain through a dashboard. And you can make it out of something as small as a single board computer and a two and a half inch laptop or, uh, you know, desktop hard drive or SSD. All of the software eventually was put into Debian 10. So that if you're using Debian 10 or 11 or 12 or any other Debian release on up, that the software would automatically be available to you and installable by you. If you added a few disks to the system, you could make it your NAS server at home. And people could go ahead and you know, share their data and their printers and everything else through the NAS system protected by the Freedom Box single board computer. Now the functionality that comes with Freedom Box is really impressive. It's things like a VPN. A lot of people pay for a VPN when they go traveling so that they could watch the you know, pro TV programs at home, so that they could uh, read email from home and things like that, just as if they were sitting in their house. But a lot of times they pay for that functionality. Maybe it's not a lot of money, but it, they still pay for it. Well, using a Freedom Box, you can set up your own VPN system through software called OpenVPN. A lot of people want to run their own email server on that, or they want to be able to uh, have a tour account, or they want to be able to set up a firewall. Well, Freedom Box helps you do all of these different things, and it's relatively easy to set up. It may not be mom and pop easy, but Anybody who is a fairly good systems administrator would be able to use this with no problem. But on top of Freedom Box, you could also put other things. So you can have social media software, much like Facebook, much like Twitter, or things like that. But instead of being controlled and concentrated in one place, this is federated out across multiple systems so that your data can stay on your box, not be visible to other people, unless you want them to see it. And so this Fediverse uh, Party is a website that has all of this federated social media, and you can install and use the ones you want. Now that's one a solution of Freedom Box. It's another one, it's called Udo. And if you go into stores like McDonald's or grocery store, you'll see uh, what is known as a point-of-sale terminal. 
it allows you to put up little boxes and pictures of the goods to be sold and you touch the screen and you can tell the system what you purchased and it will add up how much you owe for that and everything. It also will allow you to have a cash drawer attached, a printer attached, a printer receipt, a scale to weigh vegetables or other loose things, a scanner for things that have a barcode, everything necessary to run a modern day point of sale system. But in addition, Voodoo has an ERP system, an enterprise resource planning system that allows you to do things like have a customer management relation, customer relationship management system, CRM. It allows you to have inventory control system. It allows you to have set up your own website. Lots of different things that you can do with Udo. And there are, com there are companies and Udo communities throughout Latin America that will help you write the different modules that you need if you can't find them in the existing modules that Udo has. So for a much cheaper amount of money, much less than you might buy, be buying from a system that's closed from a company like Oracle, who bought Micros, another POS ERP system, at a fraction of the cost, you can have the same functionality. And because it's open source, if you know p things go away, if things go bad, if you're if you uh, if your supply chain is broken. <clears throat> you can typically find local people who will be able to help you. And that's very important, finding local people, because when you pay a local person, then their money buys local food, local housing, and pays local taxes. It stays in the system. And if you're a food store and you've paid a local person to install your Udo system, and that local person then buys food from your store, You've now made back some of the money that you paid into creating that Udo system. Here's another one, Kodi, an entertainment system. Uh, you may be familiar with smart TVs, things from LG and other makers that, you know, most of the time, or a lot of the time, those smart TVs may be running the Kodi entertainment system software because Kodi allows you to get TV over cable, over the air, in the internet. It also allows you to store and play your own videos, that you get those over the internet, or you, you, you take them off a DVD. It allows you to play audio, to store your own music, and a music catalog, to store all of your pictures that you have. You know, many, many people have cat pictures. And you can store those on the disc and then play them back through your Kodi Entertainment System. But Kodi can also give you your first access to the internet, your first access to computing as part of the system. So you don't have to use it just as a TV, you can also use it as a computer terminal if you want to. Kodi system can be run on the back of a single board computer that could be plugged into the back of the LCD panel. And it's very easy to set up. If you want to set up an access point, maybe you're a business and you want to create a little ability of your customers to be able to use the internet tied into part of your internet, you can use w, OpenWRT, which allows you to set up an access point or a router. It's very powerful. It runs on a wide variety of different pieces of hardware. And you can set up secure access points and, and firewalls and things to protect your own business. Beowulf High Performance Computers. Um, in about 1995, the supercomputing industry was having problems. A lot of the companies that made supercomputers were going out of business. And... That was because they would spend millions and millions of dollars in developing the computers, then they would sell eight of them. And eventually they realized they were never going to get ahead and they went out of business. Um, at the same time, two people from NASA, Dr. Thomas Sterling and Donald Becker, created a concept called Beowulf High Performance Computing. 
because they realized that in a lot of cases they could take the really big problem and break it up into a series of smaller problems. Each one could be done by a commodity-based computer system, and they called this concept Beowulf. When they built these, they realized that by using commodity computer components instead of special purpose ones, that they, they could build a higher performance computer for about 1 40th of the price. Or, looking at it another way, if you had a certain amount of money, you could buy a computer 40 times more powerful than the supercomputer that you might otherwise have purchased. And after you got, used, you got finished using the supercomputer for the task that it had been purchased for, justified for, you could break it apart and have smaller little reconfigurable computers to solve other problems that you might have. These computer systems all had standard programming interfaces uh, for the use of programming. And so you meant you could get all sorts of applications that would run if you were using, say, Intel uh, as a Beowulf system. All sorts of different advertisements that, or, or, or problems, yeah. all sorts of different types of applications that could run on these systems. And you could have word processors and things like that, which you couldn't do with a traditional supercomputer. At this point, all 500 of the fastest computers in the world use this model of Beowulf high-performance computers. There used to be two that ran Microsoft, but Microsoft got tired of paying people to run Microsoft, so now all 500 run Linux. And if you're not in the market for a very powerful computer system to solve problems really quickly, maybe you're in the market for a highly available database cluster system so that it's always available to you. If one hardware piece of hardware fails, another one takes over. If your load starts to build, you distribute your load amongst many thousands of different PCs or you know, commodity systems to be able to make them work. And this uh, is, can be done by distributing your transactions amongst all of these systems. If one system fails, well, then you simply change this transaction to another system and have it done there. So it degrades very gently, but it's very easy to bring it back online again without having to reboot everything. It can also be made to be highly secure and you can also virtualize the different services that you want to supply, hold them in containers, and be able to move them from system to system as necessary for the current workload. So all of this is to show you that the game has changed. You no longer have to be a huge country with large companies that are going to be creating the solutions that many, many, many people really want. Computers don't have to cost millions of dollars these days even to develop them. You can develop them for a relatively small amount of money to do exactly what you want. Maybe your country doesn't have a fabrication plant for CPUs, but they do have a surface-bound technology machine that could take parts from other countries and assemble them on a board to be able to meet your needs. Uh, there's several companies and, and organizations that make open systems. BeagleBoard makes systems uh, that are completely open. Alimix also publishes their circuit diagrams, their PCB board layout, their Gerber files, all the things necessary to produce their boards. Caninos Lucos is a project that's going on in Sao Paulo, Brazil, to design, assemble, and create single board computers for the computing industry of Brazil and Latin America. You can also, if you don't have enough money to buy the tools and things you need, there's lots of web-based development tools and services out there where you can say, okay, I've designed my board, now I'm gonna send it off to the service and they will assemble it for me and I will get the board back. 
So you no longer have to buy a very expensive surface mount technology machine. You can actually, you know, contract for the services and cut your development costs down dramatically. Once you have your prototype created, you then can do your marketing of your prototype over social media. You don't need to have a really expensive advertising campaign or marketing campaign for your devices. You can do marketing through things like Indiegogo or um, oh, great, Kickstarter or one of the other uh, processes of starting systems and financing them in the early beginnings. And speaking of financing, that's all a lot easier too. Number one, because you're asking for smaller amounts of money to get you started off the ground. And number two, because you have a way of creating a prototype that you can show to people to help them understand your vision of what you want to do. And once you do that, you can start your Kickstarter program. You can sell bonds to people who are your friends and family. You say... I'm not going to be able to pay you back right away, but when I do, I'm going to pay you much better interest than you would have gotten by putting your money in the bank. Of course, there is a certain amount of risk, there always is, but hopefully you've done a good job and that you will be able to make money and start your own business and pay back your bonds with interest that will help to, uh, that will reward the people who had faith in you and invested in you. Once you've started your company, you may want to think about how you're going to formulate it. A lot of companies in the United States, they're either a single owner business where the owner gets all of the resources, all the profits, and the employees get paid a salary. Or you may be able to have an employee or customer-owned company where the employees get a lot more of the profits of the company because they are the ones who help to make the uh, products that are selling or the services are selling. And this is a much more uh, kinder way, better way, I think, to run a company than the traditional capitalistic company with a, a CEO boss and a bunch of board members and a bunch of stockholders who for the most part, don't even know where the company is, what they're doing, or why they should be investing in them. They just saw something where they might be able to make money. They had no real vision. So employee-owned cooperatives, in my vision, in my feelings, are the way to go to start companies going and to keep them going. And in the United States, there were about 30,000 employee-owned cooperatives that exist. So with that, oh, and finally, this, the, the training of all these people. How do you train users and programmers and network admins? Well, I believe the best way of training them is to the use of free and open source software. When you use closed source software, you, you train people how to use the software to solve their problem. So basically, you train them one time. If you're using Microsoft Office, you train them to use Microsoft Office, you're training them how to use Microsoft Office to solve their problem, which is creating a document. However, if you teach them how to use LibreOffice, then you can teach them three times. You teach them how to make your document using LibreOffice. That's number one. You say, okay, how does LibreOffice make your document? And if you take a look at the source code for LibreOffice, you may see how it actually creates your document. So that's twice you've been taught. And then you say, gee, you don't like the way that LibreOffice does this. Well, why don't you get the source code and change it to make it better? And there's a third way you can teach. How do you make the software better? So... Closed source software teaches you one time. Open or free software teaches you three times. And I think that that being taught three times is very, very important, particularly at a university level. But I want to see free software and open source taught throughout the different grades 
throughout, you know, throughout life. And even when you go into the, the part where you've graduated from university, you're now you're working at work, a lot of times you have to self-teach. And self-teaching using free and open source software is much better than self-teaching through proprietary software. Because if you're looking at documentation and it doesn't quite make sense, with free software you can go back and look at the uh, software itself to see how it works. And everything you need to know is free and online. What you want out of a university or what you want out of a certification or what are the objectives that I should be meeting after I've done this study? What should I be able to do? And every course you take, every book you read, you should be thinking to yourself, what can I do after I've read this book, after I've invested my time? So, but once you've done that, once you've discovered that path, everything you need to know is available online. So there's nothing that stops you. And then once you've learned the information, you want to take the certification test to show other people that you have learned it. And this certification test can be used to get you a job. Now, certification isn't the only thing that will do that, of course. You may need to have letters of recommendation. You may need to show projects and examples. And this is another advantage of open source. Because let's say you're taking a course in database design. You could go in and find one of the databases I talked about, fix bugs for them, you know, implement new little features for them and maybe eventually get onto the core team of these of these databases that are free and open. But then if you go to work for a database company, they can look at the code which you've generated, they can look at the email that you sent, they can see the ideas that you've created. All of this is available through an open source project that would not be available through a closed source project. Closed source software doesn't show you the names of the people that work on it. Closed source software did not show you the discussions at the company's mailing list. Closed source software, a lot of times, don't even show you the bug reports that you have put in because they don't want you to see how buggy the software is. And of course, all software is buggy. So I believe that open source and free software gives a much better chance of people becoming trained and being very good programmers than closed source does. So with that, I'll stop talking. I understand we have a few minutes for questions, and I would be more than happy to try and answer them. Thank you very much for coming.